listening to audio from the table. If you'd like to learn more about our community or donate to this ministry, please visit thetabletx.org. Hello, Table Podcast listeners. Brett here. And it's so good to be with you all yet again. So we are in part three in our series titled Stranger Things, When the Bible Gets Weird. And uh, in this series, we've been looking at just various stories in the scriptures that at first glance, you know, we might think, hmm, God could never really speak to me through this. <laughs> and uh, and yet, I believe the Holy Spirit can use any and every scripture to do just that. Now, Having said that, following the church fathers and mothers like Gregory of Nyssa and Macarena the Younger, St. Augustine, and others, um, in order for that to happen, we may have to approach the text more with spiritual eyes and ears, um, ready to receive a word from God that might go a little bit different direction, or maybe a drastically different direction, than that purely drawn from the literal level. Because... Um, certain scriptural stories, I don't, I'm not saying the majority, but you know, certain ones read as just pure like history and just so narratives of what happened and you know, who God is and whatever, they can absolutely be like theologically problematic and morally problematic. Um, having said that, as we keep the character of Christ at the center of our reading of scripture, um, I really believe that inevitably God will speak to us. So maybe that introduction kind of raises more questions in your mind than it offers answers. But uh, the good news is that our text today is honestly the perfect example of exactly what I'm talking about. A story which approached purely at the literal level is really problematic. And I say that not as a like modern Protestant theological liberal who's standing over the text of scripture as like judge and jury and wagging my finger at the Bible. Um, instead, honestly, it's precisely because I am a Christian, because I believe that Jesus Christ and his character provides the interpretive key to who God is and thus to reading and interpreting scripture well. That's why I can stand and say, yeah, you know, this part or certain aspects, like it's problematic, but it can be redeemed, healed, restored. All scripture can be redeemed because of Jesus Christ. So let's go ahead and read the story. And I think you, you might see a bit more um, of where I'm coming from. So with this in mind, the title of my message is Vulnerability and the Great Bear Attack. Our story is from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 24. From there, Elisha, he was a, a prophet, Elisha went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. <laughs> Get out of here, Baldy. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. <laughs> End of story. That's it. Uh, can you see you know, where certain stories might be problematic? Um, atheists like Richard Dawkins and, and others delight in passages like these <laughs> because for them... You know, it's just further proof of the ridiculousness of the Bible. And um, now, often in response to that, Christian commentators and theologians and pastors who, you know, we feel the need to, like, defend this as, like, well, this this really happened, and, and this is a true reflection of the character of God, and, you know, we've come to know Jesus. And so what, what we'll often do um, is point out, you know, um, some of the, the etymology of the words and such. So we'll look at like, for example, the term translated here, the terms translated here as young boys are a combination of two Hebrew words, na'ar, katan. So the term na'ar, this means, um, well, it has a variety of different meanings depending on the context. It can mean baby, boy, young boy, youth, servant, or even priest. So for example, it's the term used in the book of Exodus, to refer to adorable little baby Mew Moses in his uh, his cute little basket floating down the Nile, uh, he was a a little little nar there. Um, now, at other times though, as I mentioned, it can be used to refer though to like a servant or even a priest. Now you say, well, maybe it was an adult priest or something. Well, the term katan here this means um, the second word. It means small, little, young. 
So we've got an emphasis here on age. Um, now, having said this, you know, in other words, perhaps we shouldn't envision five-year-olds here. But as a former teenage boy myself, I will admit this, this sounds like something stupid I might have done. So, you know, let's maybe go with teen boys, still young, like not adult, but perhaps not, you know, we're not talking five-year-olds. Um, maybe even teen priests of a rival religious tradition. So that's how some Christian commentators will defend this story. They'll, they'll try and, you know, kind of name like, well, these aren't exactly kindergartners and, you know, they should have known better. Um, other Christian scholars, theologians down through the years, though, are like, eh, no, no, this just isn't in line with the character of Christ. Full stop. Um, for example, Friedrich Wilhelm Krumacher, writing in the, uh, back in the 1830s from Germany, he had this to say about the story. Um, and his, he wrote a kind of a long book about the prophet Elisha. And he said this, a deadly burst of vengeance upon a troop of wanton youths. You can tell he's writing in the 1830s. <laughs> wanton youths. A curse pronounced upon them in the name of the Lord. How characteristic of the legal dispensation. In other words, the Old Testament. But how opposite to all we have said of the character and call of Elisha as a messenger of the kindness and love of God, our Savior. So, you know, in the end, I'm pretty much with Krumacher here, um, approached as a just-so story of who God really is. Like, you know, Jesus is nice, but just wait till you meet his dad. <laughs> that's just, that's just bad theology. That's poor Trinitarian theology. And it really, it just renders this story, it's just problematic. Um, however, read, uh, allegorically read as like a parable, um, read spiritually, you might say, which is honestly how in the first 1500 years of the faith, um, this was often, um, the scriptures as a whole were read. Uh, this story, it, it's, I think it's different. Um, so that's how we'll approach it tonight. Now, as I get into this, I should give a nod to an Eastern Orthodox Christian thinker named um, Jonathan Pajot for really helping me kind of think of this story in, in a new, new way. So let me start here. I had a moment four months ago when I realized I was going bald. Something about the very top, the, the crown of my head, it felt weird. It felt like different in the wind. <laughs> you don't think of something like that, but until it changes and then you're like, wait a second. My hair fe feels weird in this wind. Uh, it felt different when I would run my hands through it, like, you know, for a shampooing or whatever in, in the morning. Uh, so I went into my backyard where there's good sunlight and I took out my phone and kind of awkwardly extended my arm and then I, I snapped a picture of the crown of my head and then I looked at it and lo and behold, I was bald. <laughs> it's like this perfect kind of circle. And in that moment, I just, I let it sink in. I was like, hmm, I'm going bald. I'm going bald. It's, oh, it, it's happening. Okay, okay. And, you know, honestly, I was like a little proud of myself because I didn't cry. Uh, in fact, I, I felt a certain peace wash over me. I was like, you know what? It's okay. I'm getting older. It comes for all of us. Lord, into your hands, I commit myself. Uh, now, the thing was, a few days later, it started to grow back. And I realized, like, oh, wait, I had just gotten a haircut. And um, they had accidentally shaved it. Like, basically, they just scalped me there. Um, so, But nonetheless, for at least a few days, I felt the insecurity that I was like, oh, oh, wow. Okay, feeling, feeling a little vulnerable here. Now, perhaps you say, well, that story, that doesn't count. That's not true vulnerability. <laughs> you can't relate. Uh, okay, so let me get a bit more personal and, and real with something about my own body. Um, that kind of makes me feel a little, a little vulnerable. So since my, I think it was around like my mid-20s, I um, have these random lumps that come up. They are lipomas. Some of you are familiar with these. They're, thank God, like non-cancerous. But there's these like kind of, some of them are very small and some are kind of mid-sized like lumps. And they're like on my arms and... Um, mostly on like my, my trunk, the, the core, uh, back and in front. And, you know, truth be told, I'm like, I'm a little insecure about them. It's even though it's been, you know, years and I've, in ways I've gotten used to them, but at another level, like, I don't know, I just kind of worry about like, I don't know, people pointing them out or something. It's, it's like this part of my body 
that just is uh, unbeautiful, imperfect. You know, it just, it feels vulnerable. Some of you know, uh, three weeks ago, my grandmother, who was 94 years old, passed away. And uh, if you knew her, she was absolutely full of life. In fact, up until just 10 days before her death from stomach cancer, she was riding around in a vehicle with her daughters, delivering meals on wheels, lunches to the elderly. Her, 94 years old, with cancer? <laughs> it's like she was the one delivering the meals. I mean, she was so vibrant, so full of life. And yet, after driving through the night and, and coming to her deathbed, I, I stood there next to her and I, I saw like even her, even her, before she passed away, her body, human bodies, are just so vulnerable. So vulnerable. You see, to be human is to live with vulnerability. We are, in ways, all quivering nerve endings. There's, there's insecurity, there's weakness, there's um, fear about those insecurities and weaknesses, like in every single one of us, there are aspects of ourselves, of our, our faces, of our um, bodies, our personalities, um, even like our, could be social standing or relationships or our past histories and story, like things that, oh, we don't, we don't like, don't want anyone to find out about that. In, in other words, all of us, every single one of us have soft spots chinks in the armor, we might say. Places where people when, can cut with their words, and when they do, oh, it, like, it cuts us deeply. And of course, we can pretend like we're fine. Oh, no big deal. But we're lying liars. It, it kills us. So returning to our story, read as a parable of sorts, here's, I think, a key takeaway. There are few things more awful and foolish than mocking and exposing the physical or emotional imperfections and vulnerabilities of others. I mean, it's awful because there is something kind of predatory about it. You know, I'm strong in this area and you're weak, so I'm going to highlight my strength and emphasize your weakness. Draw it out for you and others to see. Like, ugh. That's like the worst, most reptilian parts of us that act like that this. So that's why it's awful. However, it's foolish, I think for a different reason. And um, this is something Jonathan Pajot named. He, he said it's, it's foolish because it's like there seems to be some law of the universe. Some religious traditions, like in the East, call it karma. The Bible calls it reaping what you sow or harvesting what you plant. Uh, but the point is effectively um, very similar. It's this idea applied to this, this story is that when I chronically expose the vulnerabilities of others, I create the very conditions for my own vulnerabilities to be exposed. Let me say it one more time. When I chronically expose the vulnerabilities of others, I create the very conditions for my own vulnerabilities to be exposed. Like thinking of the story... Here's these, these skinny little teens <laughs> in all their beauty mocking another man's vulnerability, right? Reveling in their own youth and their luscious locks of hair <laughs> when suddenly their own vulnerability is shockingly on display. And this is why it's foolish. It's, it's foolish to expose others' vulnerability and to draw it out because the truth is you are vulnerable too. You know, it's interesting, the, um, in the original language of the Bible in Hebrew here, um, it's very clear that it is to female bears, not just bears, female bears. And I wonder if that's a nod in ways to the like powerful kind of protective feminine instinct to protect the vulnerable. By feminine, I don't mean like literal biologically female. Uh, I mean that, that, that instinct, that heart kind of within each of us that is protective and even fierce in defense of the vulnerable. And like, even today we have these sayings, you know, we will say things like, you don't mess with mama bear. <laughs> what, what's that name mean? Like we know there is this powerful protective kind of feminine instinct in us, in animals, and oh, you're a fool 
if you mess with that, the, the perfect modern example of this uh, is, of course, the entire Me Too movement. It was exactly this principle playing out. I mean, what happened in Me Too? You, you had um, men in positions of power, and they have for, uh, I mean, my goodness, hundreds, thousands of years, millennia, um, used our like physical strength, material um, social standing, social power, uh, use that over women to exploit them, to prey upon their vulnerability. And, and what happened in that movement? The bears attacked. Men began to reap the rotten fruit of the tragic seeds they had sown in exploiting in a chronic way the vulnerabilities of other people, and specifically women, they themselves became vulnerable and they were devoured. And um, no one was sad. <laughs> like, right? You, you know, like, oh, we got it coming. See, when I expose the vulnerabilities of others, I make myself vulnerable. That's the principle. Now, that can seem all quite intense and somewhat doom and gloom, so I, I do think there's good news here. Um, because if it's true that there is nothing more awful and foolish than exposing the vulnerability of others, then might it be true that there are few things more beautiful than honoring and protecting the vulnerability of the people around you? And in the same way, there is like a curse kind of hiding in the chronic exposure of other people's vulnerability. Might there be a blessing hiding in its opposite? In other words, when I honor and protect the vulnerabilities of others, I end up creating the very conditions, a, a culture, a community where my own vulnerabilities are honored and protected. So in closing, let's get really practical. Like what might this look like in everyday life? Um, number one, physical, emotional, or sexual abuse is not acceptable behavior. Not ever. Like friends, there's just no room for abuse in the kingdom of God. Whether it is um, like spouses taking advantage of their partner's lack of physical strength or a parent taking advantage of their own children's vulnerability, or maybe later a child taking advantage of their own parents' physical or mental vulnerabilities. Uh, or in our, our setting, a church, like there's no room for a pastor or a church leader to manipulate others spiritually. We talked about old Balaam a few weeks back, if you listen to that message. Uh, there's just no room for that kind of um, exposure and manipulation and abuse. Like, no, it's just, it's not okay. It's not okay. And I also want to mention, if you're a victim of these sorts of things, please reach out and talk with myself, with someone you trust. Um, like, I'll believe you. That will be my default mode um, to, to believe you. Um, so, all right, so that's the first kind of principle. Um, second um, application would be, be very careful about uh, what you kind of share about another person when they're not present. Be very careful what you share about another person when they are not present. I'm thinking especially in our church community at the table where, you know, you've got people in like our meetups, small groups. Um, folks are sharing very honestly and openly. And that, that, what are they doing? They're making themselves vulnerable. And so we have to be very careful with um, the information we have about others because again, this isn't, isn't just about like, you know, physically exploiting others. This could be emotional. It could be um, psychological. We've, we've got to um, protect and other or protect and honor others' vulnerability. A good rule of thumb is like, if you aren't sure whether you can share a thing, uh, don't. <laughs> that's probably the, that's the safest bet. Like, I don't really know if I should share. Well, then uh, let's just not. Um, all right. Third application. Efforts at societal justice are not only beautiful acts on behalf of victims, they are, they are actually acts of generosity for society as a whole because they keep the bloody bears at bay. Uh, I, I was thinking of this, like it's easy at times for those in power 
to, um, you know, almost be kind of annoyed by those constantly sounding the alarms for justice. Um, but, you know, one way to reframe it is to think of all those wonderful Enneagram 8s, you know, who are like, hey, they're keeping folks accountable. Um, instead of being opposed to them or annoyed or like, oh my gosh, would you just give me a break? You know, instead, think of them as your best friends. Honestly, I would rather have the gentle wound of a friend keeping me personally, keeping the table, keeping um, my community, our society accountable today. I'd much rather have that than the bears of justice mauling me tomorrow. <laughs> so yeah, there, there really is, there's something so um, beautiful and Christ-like about protecting and honoring the vulnerabilities of, of others. Even thinking of Jesus himself, I was um, remembering that story uh, from the Gospel of John with the woman um, who was allegedly caught in the act of adultery by the Pharisees I, and other religious leaders. I don't know how they caught her in that. It's a strange thing to say. We caught her in the very act of it. Like, uh, what? But, um, okay, no matter. Uh, but there she is, and so vulnerable, standing there next to Jesus with these accusing religious leaders and then a potential mob because Jesus had attracted a big crowd, and that was why the Pharisees, the religious leaders, brought her there because, ah, now we've got a mob. And that, that moment of Jesus asking them, well, how about you who's without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And slowly, one by one, those leaders walked away, dropped their stones, walked away. And then Jesus asks her, who, who condemns you? And she looks around and says, no one, Lord. And he says, well, then neither do I. Go and sin no more. I mean, it's such a beautiful story of, of protecting the vulnerable. This church, this is our call. Let's, let's go and do the same Let's not make others' vulnerabilities an occasion to puff ourselves up. No, let's, let's cover them. Let's honor them. And in so doing, we will actually be covering and protecting our very selves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.